to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all-around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their successes, but more important, focusing on the journey that they traveled to get there. Now, this week's guest, he's part of my how-to series. This series is where I dig deep into how people built their businesses from the ground up. And I go really in depth with my questions. So if you're looking to get into this particular business, which is the vending machine business, this is an interview that you really need to sit and pay close attention to. This week's guest is an entrepreneur like myself. He started at a very young age. I've been following him for some time now, and I've been very, very impressed with him from afar. So I knew I wanted to get him on the show at some point. Please welcome to this week's show, Mr. Jaime Ibanez. Did I get that yeah, that's right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I'm pretty excited. Uh, shout out to other people watching. And yeah. Okay, Jaime. Let's jump right into it. I got a lot I want to ask you, and there's a lot of information that I'm hoping you can provide my audience. Yeah, of course. What impressed me about you from the very beginning when I first discovered you was that you're so damn young. And, <laughs> you know, people think that they have to have a certain level of age and experience under their belts before they can go out there and try to be an entrepreneur. First and mm -hmm. foremost, how old are you? I just turned 20 a couple months ago. Congratulations. Just turned 20. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 20 years. Yeah, okay. I actually, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I started all this uh, the summer I graduated high school. How old were you when you graduated high school? I was, uh, I had just turned 18. Okay. So you've been in the business, the vending machine business now for two years. Yeah, in August 1st, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had two years. Okay, beautiful. Take me back. Did you ever have any jobs that set you up for this career? Like, where does this even come from? Um, it's, it's not as random as you think. So actually, in, like throughout all of high school, I worked at a concession stand. And my job was to drive like an actual golf cart around like soccer fields. And I would just have like a huge cooler in the back full of drinks. In the front, I would have like a whole bunch of uh, snacks and chips. And I would just drive around like, you know, selling chips and drinks to everyone. Um, I think that's kind of where the whole like still selling snacks and drinks idea came from. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so one time I was just working um, and I have a lot, a lot of free time. And I was just going through YouTube. And I saw a video of somebody that that was inventing as well. And, um, you know, he made it look pretty easy. He literally just showed himself going to fill up vending machines. He collected the money. And I was like, you know what, if he can do it, I'm pretty sure I can. Uh, so literally like two days after I saw that video, I went out and I, at that time I had like saved up all my money. Cause you know, I was, there wasn't really a lot of stuff I could buy or wanted to buy myself. Mm -hmm. So at that time I had around like four or $5,000 saved. And yeah, two days after I, I saw that video, I went out, I bought the first machine and I just jumped straight into it. Like, just like that. Okay. That's kind of how it started. So there's a lot that I want to unpack right there. Yeah. How old were you when you bought your first machine? Um, I was 18. You were 18. Yeah. Most 18 year olds don't have four or $5,000 saved. Mm -hmm. Was this money that you earned from your concession job or is it money that was inherited to you? Did your parents lend it to you? Where'd you get four or $5,000 from? <laughs> um, it was actually, well, half of it was from the job. I, I saved most of my money. Um, okay. I, you know, I lived with my parents. I didn't have not, no expenses to pay for, just my phone bill. So I saved up all my money. And then the other about half was um, I used to also sell chips in high school. Um, I forgot to mention that. So I, yeah, I sold chips, you know, just walking around through class with a bag full of chips, sold it to kids. I had uh, like two or three of my friends doing the same thing for me. So I gave them like one bag in the morning. At the end of the day, they would give me the money. And at the end of the week, I would pay them, you know, 50 bucks. Um, so I kind of just saved all, all my money because I didn't, I knew I wanted to start a business after I graduated high school, but I never knew what. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I saved my money because I knew it was going to be used for something. 
Okay, so you always knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. And I love that story. You were a little hustler in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so you see this video. You say, you know, I kind of get this whole vending thing because I'm somewhat doing it now in my concession job. Mm -hmm. If he could do it, I can do it. Number one, what market are you in? Market? Yeah, what, where, where do you live? Oh, I'm here in Dallas, Texas. Okay, Dallas, Texas. Vending machines are not at your local Walmart. Vending machines are not at Target. No. Where did you even find your first vending machine? How much was it? And was it new or was it used? So my first ever one, it was use it was on location already actually so it was already set up inside of a business i didn't have to like look for one to place it and that one i spent 2500 stop there which was stop there very important uh, it was already on location yeah how did you know it was for sale and how did you even negotiate getting it well, I had actually gone through Craigslist and I just typed in vending machine because I was gonna I was gonna just buy one and then put it on location. And I just bumped I ran into a post and I guess there was a previous vendor that was getting out of the business and he just uh had just you know set up the post as he was selling the machine with the with the location already set up, uh which you can do even until now. People just sell locations just like that. Um so yeah, I had saw the post and it was the only one that I that I had seen. So I, you know, I messaged them and I was like, hey, you know, like what all do I need to get the transfer process started? And it's just pretty simple. It's just it's just how like if you buy a car, you know, all you gotta do is just sign the bill of sale. Um, introduce me to like the manager there just so they know that I'm gonna be the the new guy basically. And that was it. Okay. Simple as that. This was your first vending machine that you bought. Yeah. Did your parents help you with this transaction or did you do it on your own? Um, it was all on my own. I, it, was a, it was an hour away. I drove over there myself and just everything. Uh, my parents aren't really know much about business or how you know, stuff really works. So I did have to learn everything. And so the first negotiation from start to finish was all you. Yeah. Looking back, you, you get the machine for 2,500, correct? Mm hmm is that the average price of a used machine? And is it, is that the price of a machine that already comes with its own location? So if somebody's watching this, give me an idea of what would I spend on a used machine and then I have to go out and figure out a location versus a used machine that is already making money, already has its own location. Okay. Um, yeah, so it really, it has a lot of factors. For example, if you just buy like a used normal machine without a location, it's gonna, it can be anywhere from like 500 to like a thousand bucks, not really as much as you expect. If you buy like a brand new machine, like top of the line right now, you know, still without a location, those run for about like five, $6,000 per machine. Um, but if you want one that has location, it really depends on how much money they make per month. That's like a, that's what you really go for. Um, so for example, let's say a location makes 400 bucks a month. Um, of course it also depends on the machines. If you have like older or newer machines, but normally that what we go for whenever we buy locations is buying it for the, how much they make for, for 10 months, 10 to 12 months. 10 so, to 12 months. Yeah, so if the location makes four hundred bucks a month, about four thousand dollars. Okay, got and you. So now, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. That well, that, yeah, it's basically like the basic. Like it also depends if the machines are like new, if, if they're like old. If they're like you know really old, then you can be paying like half of that or like a lot less because you would just be paying for the location itself. So the machine that you bought, was it a good location? Was it older? Was it newer? Is that 2,500 looking back now, was that a fair price that you got for that machine? It actually was uh, just because that machine alone, brand new was, uh, it was like 4,000. Um, and I paid 25 with the product already in the machine, already on location. Um, I will say this though, 
two days after I got that location, I actually got kicked out from there. So that's how, that's how the first one. Um, why is that? I, I don't know. I, I, got, I, got, I bought the location from the guy, and then for some reason, he just texted me like two days later. It was like, hey, the manager, uh, I, apparently like they switch managers like all the time. And I guess I got like a new manager and I guess he just didn't want the machine no more. So he was like, hey, he said you have a week to go take the machine out. I was like, okay. And Okay, question. Before we move the, the interview on, is there any special certificates or licenses or education needed to start this type of business? Uh, not really much. It, it depends per state and sometimes per county. Uh, for, for example, here in Dallas where I am, all you need is, you know, the business license, like a LOC or something like that. And, uh, the tax ID and just those two things. That's it. Okay. Is there yeah. any special skill set outside of, you know, your licenses or your certificates? Do I need to be a certain type of person? Do I need to be somebody who's good with math? Maybe I need to be somebody who's extremely organized. Are there any special skill set requirements needed for this type mm -hmm. of business? I would say nothing too crazy, but, but I mean, you do have to be organized, not just in this business, but you know, in every business. Uh, but yeah, definitely organized, especially figuring, figuring or trying to figure out what drinks and snacks you have to get ready to go and fill up machines. Um, another, another one that a lot of people are afraid of is like fixing machines. Like, do I have to be technical to mm -hmm. learn how to fix them? And it's actually not as hard as you think. Also, um, there's not too many issues that come with the machines. Uh, I want to get to that a little bit later in the interview. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Beautiful. Um, so you're saying in terms of skill set, there's not much really needed, you know, as long mm -hmm. as you're a hustler, as long as you're on top of your business. Anybody can really get into this business and excel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would just say do your research because uh, if you buy good machines, then you won't have as much problems as, you know, okay. not good machines. Got you. You kicked out of your first location, which brings me mm -hmm. to an important part of this interview. How do you find locations for your machines? Walk me through the process I have a machine. I know I want to be in this business, but now what do I do? So how uh, do you find these locations? So there's a, there's a lot of ways you can find locations. I know the most popular one that people use is they just go door to door asking, you know, talking to owners, managers. Uh, that's, that's my least favorite way. Honestly, I feel like there's more efficient ways, um, but that's, that still works. Even to this day, you can go down to, a warehouse or you know hotel see if they got machines um but it's it's pretty simple asking them you you just show up and you're like hey um do you guys have any machines um you know if they if they say no uh, you can show them pictures uh, i know some people have like little books of you know their whole service written out um you know of course you can be like professional show up with like a uniform shirt maybe like a name tag uh but yeah you you just simply ask like, hey, you want, do you guys want vending machines? And it's just that simple. Okay, you said that that is not the most efficient way. What is the most efficient way that you found? I found to be more efficient is by emailing, which uh, surprisingly not a lot of people do. Really? But it's just so, yeah, it's just so easy going in. Because there's just, you know, you're, you're on Google. You can search up so many businesses way much faster. You get their contact emails, throw it on, uh, on Google, and just you know, copy and paste the same uh, email that you're going to send everyone because pretty much it's going to be the same thing, you know, offering the service. Uh, and that way you can just email a whole bunch of more businesses and going door to door. Okay. That's what I've done. Say, say I'm a business owner and yeah. you are going door to door. What does that conversation look like? Um, so I would walk in, I'd be like, I asked, you know, I asked for the manager or the owner and then I'd be like, Hey, nice to meet you. My name's Jaime. I work, I always say I work for a local vending machine company. I don't say that I'm the owner. Cause Why is that? I, um, cause I feel like sometimes people might think I'm too young and they don't really, they might not really want me to service them and, you know, have, or be working with them. 
because uh, I, I just feel like they might think I don't, I'm, I might not do the job right. So, <clears throat> yeah, I would just walk in and I'd be like, hey, uh, my name's Jaime. I work for a local vending machine company. I, just, I was just going to stop by and see if you guys have vending machines. And if they say, that, you know, they don't, um, then I can just pull up like a picture on my phone. I should basically tell them like how it works. Um, and I also, I don't offer them commission um unless they ask me for I, I i love that Let, let's let's clarify that because that's where i was about to go in this conversation mm. initially you walk in you introduce yourself you you want to speak to a manager or owner correct yeah is do you speak to anybody in between there if let's just say it's i, I don't know a front desk assistant are mm -hmm. you always asking for the person who's the decision maker yeah, all, all the time. Um, if it's not the decision maker, I give them like a run through of like why I'm there uh, mm -hmm. just so they can know. But I never like tell them the whole thing because, you know, at the end of the day, they're not going to be able to tell me yes or no. So either I just come back uh, next time or, you know, wait for them to call me back if they do, which most of the time they, they don't. Okay. This is the part I wanted to get to because there's mm -hmm. a lot of people out there and they're looking to get in this business and they think automatically that there has to be some type of business transaction done between themselves and the business itself, mm -hmm. the location itself, excuse me. You yeah. said you don't bring up splits off the mm -hmm. bat? Yeah, no, I, I don't. And I wouldn't recommend anyone. I know, I actually know some people that use that as like a way to get in because uh -huh. you, str you straight out just offer them money. Um, but no, uh, for myself, I, I never do. Ever? Unless they ask for it. Yeah, unless they ask for it. Okay, say that they ask for it. What's a fair percentage? Um, it depends per location. For example, the... The location I have right now that I pay the most is it's thirty percent, and that's at a it's at a hotel. Okay, uh, it's thirty percent from profits though, not from the girl sales. Understood. Is there contracts? You know, now you got my attention. Mm -hmm. I'm the business owner. You walked in. You give me your spiel. I'm like, you know what? Maybe this can attract more business. You know, mm -hmm. I own a hotel or whatever. People are going to want snacks in the middle of the night. Jaime, go ahead. Bring your machine in here. Mm -hmm. If, in fact, I do want to split with you, are you starting with a base of 10% and working your way up? Where, where do you come up with it? Is there a standard? Is there an average number? 30% seems a little high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is pretty high. It, and it, I... And I know some people that pay a lot more. I, I know some people that pay half, 50%. Uh, for me, I, I will never pay more than 30% just because I feel like it's not going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, but 30% is what I pay. I normally, if it's like a regular business, like a warehouse, an office, I normally start off around like 15%. Okay, you uh, got like 15 a, yeah, like 10 to 15, it's normally 15. And I, I normally tell them that it's, if I, if I say it's 10%, I normally tell them that it's because that's going to allow me to still keep the prices lower. Because the higher the, the higher the percentage, the higher I'm going to put the prices. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a way to, you know, tell them like, hey, you know, the least commission I can give you, the lower the prices I can, I can have. Uh, so I do start around 15% if they're like, uh, you know, it's kind of too low because it sounds low, you know, 15% out of all the sales, I would go up to like, okay, 20, um, at the most, most 25, 30. And that's only for like hotels, which do good, you know, cause everyone wants a hotel and yep. they're pretty hard to get. Okay. <clears throat> Once you have solidified this deal, is it a handshake deal do you put anything on paper? And if you do have a contract, is it something you've written up or did you find it online? So if my audience is looking for a standardized contract, could they just go in online and, and get the verbiage and download it? Yeah, you can find it now. You can just type in like vending machine agreements. Um, there's even some for like the, where it gives you an option for the commission to write down the percentage. Um, but for me, most of the time, it's, well, actually every time, it's just by handshake. Um, I've never done a contract, which 
I know some people that only do contracts because, you know, they don't want to lose the, the location. They mm -hmm. want to like have it locked in. But in my opinion, I feel like as long as you just give good service, you know, you're there filling up the machines, people lose their money, you know, give them their two bucks or whatever. As long as you just give a good service, you're not going to get kicked out. And I feel like, I just feel like that's the, the way it's going to work. Um, so yeah, I've never done a contract. Got you. You started off with one machine. How many machines do you have now? Uh, I'm up to about 30 now. In two years? In two years, yeah. In two years, starting out yeah. at 18 years old, you're up to 30 machines? Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm really thankful. I, I was never, I would have never thought that I would have this much, you know, especially in two years. But I, what did help me out, honestly, was, you know, making YouTube videos about it. All the people that watch my videos, which I'm really grateful for them. Because um, sometimes the vending machines can get pretty expensive. I'm not going to lie. Especially whenever you have 30 in two years, which you have constantly have to keep buying. Um, so, yeah. Okay. When you buy these machines, are you buying all of them with a location or are you now buying them and storing them? And if so, where do you store your machines? So whenever I first started, I started off buying them on location because uh -huh. before or whenever I first started, it was, pretty, it was pretty easy to go online and find locations for sale with machines already placed. Um, but ever since like the vending machine industry just you know blew up, um, it's kind of hard now to find locations. Like I go on Craigslist or whatever, and if one pops up, it's gone within like a couple of days because, you know, there's so many people that want to start out. So they're out buying, you know, machines already placed. So that's how I started. I, that's how I got like the first like six, seven machines mm -hmm. already on location. Um, and then the, the, the rest of them, I had to actually go out, find the locations and I would, Buy the machines first before I got the location, just so I wouldn't keep the you know the business waiting, which is a good tip. A lot of people have questions like, do I buy the machine first or do I get the location first? And I would highly recommend getting the machine first because I've had you know times I've heard stories where people wait until they get a location, so now they have to go and find the machine. It takes them a long time; they can't get it ready, and then the location doesn't want the machine anymore. Okay, where are you storing these machines? If you're buying the machine first, these mm -hmm. are not, it's, it's not like a laptop you're buying. Yeah. You just sit in this side of a room. Like, where, uh -huh. if you're buying a machine and you're sitting on it, where are you storing it? So, at first, whenever I lived in my parents' house, uh, that's where I started. Uh, we didn't have a garage. So, I actually ended up putting all the machines in my girlfriend's uh, garage. And, you know, thankfully, her mom was okay with it. Um, I put my machines in there for maybe like around four, five, six months. And after that, I was like, okay, you know what? I need more space to actually work on these machines, make videos here whenever I have to. Uh, so I got a storage unit and I just put them in there. Okay. You're up to 30 machines now. Are the mm. machines buying themselves meaning are you taking profit and reinvesting in your business have you taken out a small business loan where are you getting the money to buy all of these machines uh it's all or most of the money that that i used was actually from youtube um youtube was actually pretty good for me last year and that's how i was able to constantly keep buying machines um so yeah that's how i was able to pay for all of them I was going to get a loan whenever I first started because I didn't really have the, the income. Like, because I would get locations coming in, but I just didn't have the money to, you know, to buy more machines. Uh, but then, you know, I started making videos and... I, and you, know, you started seeing a different revenue stream that which helped you yeah. with the Avenger machine business. Understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Machines are, you know... You can look at videos and see what they're doing in Asia. These machines are light years ahead of when I was growing up. And it was those little bubblegum machines that you put a quarter in and you turn the knob. You know, for you, are you always trying to get the latest machines? Are you comfortable buying these used machines? And if you buy used machines, can you update them? Is it, you know, a way that, 
I don't, I don't know, you buy components and just continuously update and make them more modern, even though they're older um, machines. So I actually don't buy brand new machines. Uh, never? No, no, never. Uh, I, oh, actually, I bought one, but just it was an ice cream machine just because you can't really find those used. So I, I needed one for a location. So I just, I've just bought one just because I had to, but I wouldn't recommend anyone that wants to start to buy a, a brand new machine just because they're, they're way too expensive in my opinion. How much? How uh, much is the average to, to a brand new machine? Uh, I mean, top of the line, you know, $5,000 for just one. And that would just be for like the snack machine. You would still need the drink machine, of course. How much so, on average for a used machine? Used machine, like 500 to a thousand bucks. And I... I don't buy older machines. I only buy machines. Oh, like you were talking about, there is some machines you can upgrade. Um, but basically, I only buy machines that you can put a credit card reader on. Does that makes okay. sense? Because there's a, a lot of ones that you know you you can't. So, and there is some that you can't upgrade, like you said. Okay, you said you don't buy older machines. Do you just mean in terms of the credit card? Or are you talking about in terms of a certain year? So are you saying I would never buy a machine that is older than 2005? Mm -hmm. No, just in terms of a credit card. If I can put a credit card reader on it and, and it looks still good enough, I'll, I'll still buy it. Like I have uh, most of my nicer machines that I still have right now, which are like nice, they're from like 2005. So it's still, you know, 15 years ago. And they're still some of the most used machines to this day. Understood. Talk to me about the products. What sells the best? What sells the worst? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that you're stocking your machines with? Uh, so right off the bat, drinks are always going to do good. You know, especially down here in Texas where the, this heat is like, you know, it's no joke. Uh, <laughs> drinks always, always go by pretty quick. And, you know, it's, it's always the, the usual Coke. Dr. Pepper does really, really good. Um, I do have three nursing homes and surprisingly they don't like diet drinks in there. I, I remember when I first got them, I loaded up the whole machine with just diet drinks. And next time I went in, you know, they just, they just wanted regular drinks. Um, as for like snacks, it's, you know, chips, candy, chocolate, the, the normal Hershey's, M&M's, you know, stuff like that. Um, what has never ever sold for me is healthy items like, you know, protein bars, healthy chips, um, anything healthy you can think of just will not sell. You know, I was waiting for you to finish because I, th I would think that, you know, the whole world is so health conscious. Mm -hmm. And when you said, you know, sodas, Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, I'm like, well, wondering if you know water sells really good and healthy mm -hmm. items sell really good are you saying people when they go to vending machines they're just looking for snacks i want to satisfy my sweet tooth mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's honestly the 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 reason why like i know i've seen um a few companies uh recently or not recently but in the last few years where they start it's like a vending business but it's like a healthy only vending mm -hmm. business so they only put healthy items in the machine um but i've seen those machines next to machines that have the normal stuff like the regular unhealthy stuff and they just get out beating because you know anyone that goes up to a vending machine they're gonna most of the time they're gonna go for like the chocolate bar than the the you know the protein bar and i do keep maybe like two at the most three healthy items in every machine just for anyone just in case once a healthy item um then there'll be like yeah like a protein bar maybe like some peanut butter crackers trail mix trail mix sometimes yeah pistachios some nuts you know okay where are you buying these items are, are you getting them wholesale from any special location or are we talking about sam's club and costco mm-hmm um, I mostly go to Sam's to get all the snacks and drinks. I know some people, they go to Costco. Um, there's not really that many Costco's down here, mostly Sam's. Uh -huh. So that's where I get most of the stuff from. Um, I've been looking into getting to maybe like a distributor here soon, just because 
um, I'm constantly going to Sam's because I'm getting to the point where I'm like, you know, filling up machines a, a lot of times of the day. So I can't keep going back and forth, buying more stuff. So that's what I've been looking into. Okay, let's talk about refill. You got 30 machines. Mm -hmm. How busy does this keep you? And how do you even know when to refill these machines? Is the technology there now where you have an app? Or is there a way that you know, okay, one machine on the other side of Texas really needs to be mm -hmm. refilled versus the machine down the block from me? Like, how, how do you know which machines to refill? So that's actually the reason why I said that I only buy machines that I can put a credit card reader on because uh -huh. I do on every single machine. And the credit card reader, reader that I have, it actually uh, lets you see like what's selling in the machine. So like in, also like in each individual aisle or uh, coil, I mean, so I can see exactly how many peanut m and sold. I know exactly how many, you know, Skittles sold. So whenever I had to go and fill out the machine, I know exactly of what item to take. Um, and it also shows you like the percentage of how empty it is. So I normally go fill up a machine when it gets to around like 40, I mean, I mean, yeah, like 45 to 50%. So like half empty. Um, and that's how I can know when to go to each location. And it doesn't take as much time as you think because 30 machines, um, you know, you can fill up, you can go to like seven, eight locations a day. Mm -hmm. um, from like early in the morning to like the afternoon. So in each location has like two machines. So, you know, 30 machines, that's about 15 locations that I have. I can run the whole route in like two days and still have the rest of the week. Okay. That's where I was going next. How much of your time is you spending on this business? Is this mm -hmm. a, you know, seven day a week type business? Is this something that somebody who has a full time job can have on the side walk me through an average week so an average week it really also depends if i'm gonna be i do it by like what days i have to like make a video so mm -hmm. if i have to like go and make a video of me filling up the machine i i that's how i i set the days up but if i have to go i always buy the product and get all the stuff ready the day before so if I have to go fill up like, you know, five locations tomorrow, today, I write down like what I need. I go to Sam's, put everything in the crates, um, get everything ready, load it into the van. And then tomorrow morning, wake up at 5 a.m., leave here at like 6, um, and then just, you know, run through every, every location. So typically when you're going to Sam's, you don't make refills on that day. That day is strictly for shopping? Yeah, yeah, strictly for shopping. That way the, the next day, um, it's just more time efficient and I just go from stop to stop. There is some times where like, I would go to Sam's and they don't have the stuff that I need. So the mm -hmm. next day that I'm filling up the machines, I, I would just have to like quickly stop by another Sam's to get some stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's normally just filling up the machines to get it done as quick as possible. How many hours out of your day? And I'm just trying to get a sense because, you know, you're doing this full time. There may be somebody who just wants to do this and earn extra income on the side. So mm -hmm. Sam's, what is that, about three hours out of your day? Sam's, like getting the product ready? Say that again? Um, are you mean, do you mean like how long do I spend like going to Sam's and getting Yeah, going to ready? Sam's, putting enough product in your car to get ready to mm -hmm. um, refill your, your, your machines? Uh, yeah, if it's going to be like a busy day the next day, uh, getting all, writing all the stuff down, maybe like an hour, going to Sam's, another hour, coming back home, putting everything into the crates. Yeah, like three, four hours. Okay. Just, just to get everything ready. So the next two days, you have about 15 locations. The next two days, you, can, you said you can do seven, eight locations in a day. When mm -hmm. you say in a day, are we talking an eight-hour day? Are we talking a six-hour day? Are we talking a 10-hour day? I would say like a 10 to 12-hour day. And that's actually, it's different for everyone. Um, I'm pretty sure somebody can do 10 or even more locations a day just because um, I'm here in Dallas. So like all of my locations are spread out through like all the cities around. So almost each location that I go to is an hour, is an hour away from each one. 
Um, and it only takes like 30 minutes to fill up a location, 30 to 45. Like once you get the hang of it, just go in, fill everything up, take inventory, go out onto the next one. Um, so if I didn't have to drive so much, I could easily, you know, fill up more machines. Okay, because we're here in New York. This is a very congested city. So it probably wouldn't be as spread out as your commute is. You're saying I spend most of the time in the car because that Texas overall is just mm -hmm. so spread out. Yeah, yeah, most of the time it's just me driving. Okay, talk to me about locations. You mentioned nursing homes. What are the best locations? You said everybody's fighting for hotels. Mm -hmm. For you, what are your best? And just give me an idea of all of the different types of locations you're in and which are the best and why. Okay. Um, so the, my best one right now is the, the hotel, and I only have one of those. I got, this, I got that one this year, and I got lucky with that one because that hotel is um, it's like in the middle of nowhere out, outside the city. And there's like no vendor that wants to make the drive all the way over there. Um, it how, was too far, far. how far outside the city is it? Uh, for me, it's not too far. It's like 45 minutes. Okay. okay. But that's just, that's the only location I have that way. So, but it's still my best one, even though it's, it's that far away. Um, so after that, it would be like nursing homes. Those do really, really good. How many nursing uh, homes do you have? It, I got three and it's all under the same company. So I got all three at the same time. Okay, is that is? Did you get the nursing homes from buying the route from someone, or those um, locations you went in and you negotiated the deal yourself? So the the manager actually reached out to me because uh, I think he was the one running the machines. I, he had his machines inside, and I guess he just didn't have time for it no more, or like you know, it, I don't know, he just didn't want to do it no more. So he he reached out to me. He was like, hey, you know, we got three nursing homes. Um, you know, bring some machines in and that was it. Okay. So you have a hotel. It's your best location. You got three mm -hmm. nursing homes. What do the other, um, locations look like? The rest of them are just warehouses and offices. So just okay. the normal people, you know, go into an office. Um, I have one barbershop with that one. That's the, uh, I don't remember that. I told you the first location I got, I got kicked out. Uh, yep. The barber, the barber shop was the the one where I put that machine in, and I still have it to this day. So I've been having that for about two years. Okay, good. Talk to me about your best location. How much money are you making there, and what are you selling there? Uh, so that one a month it comes out to in total sales around like twenty five hundred. Okay. And I got three machines. I got a snack, a soda, and the, the ice cream machine that I told you. Is it twenty five hundred per machine, or is it twenty five hundred total? It's all together total. Okay. Um, yeah. So total, and then after your after like I buy a product, I'm left with about I would say almost half. So you know, half of twenty five. So about twelve fifty. About twelve fifty, maybe maybe a little bit more because you know product isn't that much, and then I would subtract the thirty percent, which I give the owner. So I'm left, you know, with about a thousand bucks, which is still for profit. It's still a lot, you know, because there's some locations that make your average location is going to make four to five hundred bucks a month, like total. That's what the average is going to make. So you know, a thousand bucks and just having it for profit is still good, and I sell. Um, I sell the normal stuff, uh, like the chips and drinks. And since it is a hotel, I do add like uh, like toothpaste, shaving kits. Um, I throw like lighters in there, um, deodorants, you know, stuff for people that come in. Okay, so at your best location, you're making about twenty five hundred bucks a month. You're coming home with a thousand dollars profit every single month. Mm -hmm. If I'm getting into this business, just manage my expectations. You said the average machine is doing a total, and I'm assuming this is gross, of about $500 in sales per month. Yeah. What's the profit margin on those machines looking like? The profit margins? Uh, what do you mean? In terms of, you know, if, if I'm selling $500 worth of goods out of there, mm -hmm. 
you, in order to fill those machines up, are you filling them up with $200 worth of goods and walking, walking away with $300 in your pocket? Um, I normally just take the percentage. I never really add up um, all the product because I'm buying everything in bulk. Uh -huh. But it's normally around like 40, maybe at the most 50% will be for for product. It's mostly close to like 40%. So, you know, if you make, uh, I guess, you know, 400 bucks, almost 200 bucks would be, or a little over 200 bucks would be the profit. Okay, nice, nice, nice. Um is this a business that you can operate under the table or, you know, are you report because it's essentially in a lot of locations, it's a cash business. I know many of them are, are, um, credit card, yeah. but just in terms of the taxes and all of the different back end work that goes with it. Mm -hmm. How how does that work for you? It, you? Do you have to report every sale? So I will say that, yes, there is some people that do it under the table just for like a extra cash a month. They just have like a few machines on location. And they then that's the reason why they don't put uh, credit card readers that way. Because on the credit card readers, not only does it, does it uh, show the, the credit card sales, but also the cash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it shows those two. Um, but for me, yeah. So I basically add up all the numbers together, how much each location makes. And at the end of the year, you know, I just add everything up. I subtract all the, the product I spent, the money I spent on machines. Uh, but yeah, for 2019, I, I did file all the, the taxes for it. Okay. So you run this as a real business. Yeah. Yeah. I have a LLC set up for it. Okay. Walk me through, if you don't mind, year number one, you had from the, you're only in business for two years. Mm -hmm. You start with one machine. After year number one, how much would you say you made in this business? After, well, it's kind of hard to calculate profit for me, especially even until now, just because uh -huh. I'm constantly buying machines all the time. So there's not, you don't get to the point to where like, you stop and then all the machines, you know, you're making money and then they pay for themselves. Yep. You're just constantly buying more machines. Uh, but the first year wasn't really much. Um, I didn't have that many locations. I think the first year I was only around like, like seven, eight uh, machines for the year. Um, so maybe like a few thousand dollars for the year, but it was mostly to get into the business, learn, learn how it works, make videos about it. Uh, but this year, you know, I, I've taken it a lot more serious and we've pretty much like tripled since last year. So, okay. So are you in the six figure mark now? Uh, well for YouTube and, and vending combined. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. And I'm going to get to YouTube later. You know, you keep mentioning it. I know it's a big part of your story. It's the way I discovered mm -hmm. you. So I'm going to definitely bring that into the conversation for anybody who's watching this. It's not like I'm overlooking what he's saying about YouTube. He mm -hmm. is amazing on YouTube and I love the way you've documented your business. So we'll bring that in a little later on in the interview. Talk to me about theft, vandalism. If I'm getting into this business, how worried do I need to be about people breaking into my machines, people sticking dollars in and then pulling it back out and the, and the product still drops? How much are you experiencing that? You shouldn't worry about it too much, um, especially with the machines now. Most of the machines now, um, you can't really like use like the little old school hacks that you could back in the day. Um, but for me, I've honestly never really had issues with people trying to break in. Um, I've had one that I can think of that was like back when I first started and it was, um, it was that actually they, somebody had put tape on a dollar. They put it into the, the little bill acceptor and they pulled it up right out. Uh, or they tried pulling it out, but it got stuck inside and it actually broke it. So I had to go and, you know, replace it. And then they kept calling me like, Hey, like, when are you going to come get it fixed? And I was like, well, I mean, one of your employees, I didn't tell them that, but I mean, you know, one of their employees, it was, it was at an uh, employee only place so one of the employees you know was the one that broke it uh but yeah besides that i've never had nobody try to like shake a machine um nothing too crazy 
I do have a lot of friends in the industry though. And I mean, I've had friends that people steal the whole machine. I've had people break the glass. I have, I've had um, people uh, or friends where they have like machines inside of the business and the whole business catches on fire. Wow. Machines catch on fire. Yeah. So. That's... Okay. So talk to me about maintenance. Is there a lot of maintenance um, in turn, you know, I know you have had to fix some of your machines. Is mm -hmm. this something you can learn to do for yourself or are there professionals out there that are specifically trained in fixing vending machines? There is professionals. Um, I know, especially uh, here in Dallas, there is, there's quite a few of them. Uh, but the thing is, I would really recommend if you're going to get into it to just learn how to fix it yourself. Um, like for me, I've only had to call a professional once and that was for the ice cream machine because that was the first one I had and there was like an issue with it. I didn't know how to fix, but everything else you can, you can learn yourself. You know, you can Google the manual online and it shows you like all the parts, all the moving parts and stuff. And that way, once you know how to fix it, you know, next time it happens, you know how to fix it yourself. How difficult was it for you to learn how to fix it? Everybody's not, you know, I'm not handy. So mm -hmm. if I decided to jump into this business, I'd be very, very afraid because I, I, I could barely fix anything. Is this mm -hmm. something that is, you know, are they, these machines just relatively easy to fix where you just buy a part and then take out the old one and insert the new one? Or is it more intricate than that? For the most part, yes. Like the most common issues that you're going to mostly have uh, is if the machine doesn't take bills or it doesn't take coins. So you have to like replace that specific part inside. And it's just simple as that. You unhook it. It's just one cable. You unhook it, take it out, put the other one in, hook it, hook it back up. And it's just that simple. Um, there is other like tiny moving parts that you, I've had to switch in the past. And, you know, there's been times where I've had to try to figure out how to fix something. And I've been there for like four or five hours for like one tiny, tiny piece. But then, like I said, like you, you're gonna you're gonna most likely have those times where like you spend hours and hours trying to fix something, but it's gonna be worth it because if you're gonna be in this business for the long run, you're gonna want to know how to fix it. Is the market saturated? You alluded to this earlier, where you said once upon a time you can kind of go online and people would be selling, you know, their routes with the locations you know, is the market too saturated now or is there room for new people to come into this business? I would say it's not really saturated. I, I there is a lot of people getting into it. So there might be, it might be harder to do it now than back then, but it's definitely still possible. You can still go out, find machines used right now. You can still find locations because all the time there's new businesses closing down and opening. Mm hmm you know, I just got uh, my newest location. I just got last month and it was a new warehouse that opened up. And the first month it did a thousand bucks, you know, in total. And so, so there's always new, new spots opening up. Um, so there's still enough you know, room for everyone. So if I wanted to jump into this game right now, you're saying, look, Sean, you can actually do it. It is, it's not what it was a few years ago, but there's still a locations out there. You just got to get mm -hmm. on your grind and go find them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Cause there's still at the same time, there's still other vendors getting out. So, you know, you might find a few locations still for sale every now and then. Okay. You mentioned earlier that you bought a new ice cream machine. Is that correct? Yeah. Do you have any machines that sell hot food? Hot food? No, no, just uh, just a frozen one, and I have that set up to where I sell ice cream in the bottom half, mm -hmm. and the top half it's uh food. So it's like uh, hot pockets, burritos, corn dogs. Okay, so for a machine like that, are there special permits needed? Uh, do you have to abide by any FDA rules because those types of items they could stale, they could go bad. Mm -hmm. Is, there, is it more risky to buy those types of machines? Is, there, is it much more needed on the back end? Or, you know, you get the machine and you can set it up no different than a machine that mm -hmm. just sells candy bars and potato chips? 
For the most part, yeah. I'm not sure about other states or cities, uh, but I know here you don't really need any other permits. Uh, just because, well, number one, this machine that I got, it's a, it's a brand new machine and it has like oh, pretty much any refrigerated machine where, you, where you're going to put food in it. Uh, most of the time they do have sensors in them to mm -hmm. where if for some reason the temperature just drops to, you know, and they, everything melts or something happens, it would just cut off. So I won't let any, anybody buy something, uh, which comes in handy. It's, it's actually happened to me twice where for some reason the machine, uh, it gets hot, everything goes bad, and it's good that the machine, you know, cut off because if somebody would have bought, you know, something, a breeder or something, they could have got sick. Um, I think it's, I think you mostly need permits here if it's going to be like refrigerated food, like perishable foods, not mm -hmm. really frozen foods. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, that's that's the case. Okay. Are there places, you know, there are expos for everything out here. You know, you mm -hmm. can be in to the bridal business, there's a bridal expo. You can be into comic books, there's a comic expo. If I'm trying to learn more about this business or get into this business, I know you keep mentioning going on Craigslist and going on to these different sites. But does there exist an expo that specializes in vending machines? And if so, where are they and when do they take place? Mm -hmm. There, Yeah, there is there is a few expos. Um, the main one is actually for gumball machines, though. It's not really for, like, soda and snack. Uh, that's, that's one of the most popular ones. And that's uh, – I've, I've gone to that one the last two, two years just for fun. Um, you know, cause not, there's some vendors there that do gumball machines and also full line. So it's kind of like a, you know, you get to learn a little bit about both sides. Uh, and that takes place in around March of every year. Um, I know the first year it was in Vegas and last year it was, uh, or this year, actually it was in, uh, New Orleans. What's the but name? I know it's called NBVA. So in? the national, yeah. Uh, the national bulk vending association. Got gotcha. you. Uh, there is bigger ones specifically mainly for full line. I know there was one in, in Florida last year. I'm not sure what it was called. Uh, but the biggest, biggest ones are over there like in China or like in Japan, which there was going to be a big one this year in, in like February, I think. And, you know, obviously everything shut down. So, no, I think around March. So it got canceled. Uh, but yeah, it's like the, the world's biggest one and since it is like japan they have uh like the newest machines that you can find out there or like machines for every situation like cold food you know pizza anything you mentioned earlier schools as a location mm -hmm. how bad has covid affected your business obviously kids in certain states are not even going back to schools Mm -hmm. There are a lot of locations out there now. We've been quarantined for many months. So many of the locations that in your line of work would have gotten you a lot of money or would have made you a lot of money, no one's traveling. Mm -hmm. No one's yeah. out. People are social distancing. Has COVID hurt the vending machine business? I would say yes. For the, for the most part, yes. Um, for me, though, I honestly got lucky just because every single machine that I had uh, the lo a location in, um, they none of them shut down. So they all stayed open. Um, actually, one closed down. That was a barbershop. So that's okay, the only yep. one that shut down. So it wasn't a crazy hit on me. But every, every other one, you know, people still went to work. Like, yeah, they did have social distancing. Everyone had to wear masks. Um, the nursing home. I was barely able to get in. Surprising, surprisingly, they let me in, you know, because it was a nursing home. Uh, but for the most part, for me, uh, I didn't really take a huge hit. I actually got a lot more locations during the whole COVID situation. Um, That's I interesting. So. Why, why, why do you think? I'm not sure, honestly. I was actually surprised. It, they actually all reached out to me, so I'm not really sure how what their situation was. Um, some of them... They had, they had a previous vendor and I guess he wasn't going to like fill up the machines or, you know, he, he was slacking on it. So they kicked him out and then they brought me in. Um, and it was like that for like a few different spots. So, 
So it was the actual locations themselves that reached out to you, not necessarily yes. the vending machine owners that said, look, I want to get out of this business. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, I think this whole this whole year, actually, I haven't got, if I think, yeah, I think, if I think about it correctly, this whole year, I haven't got a location myself. They've all just reached out to me. All location owners? For this year, yeah. Okay. And congratulations, COVID has affected so many different industries. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to hear that you weren't hit personally that hard. 30 yeah, locations. No, it really... so, I'm sorry? Oh, no, I was just going to say that it, it really does suck. Um, I had, for example, Cali. I got a friend over there that has around like 150 machines, and they're all shut down. Just Exactly. Completely. Yeah, I mean, um, the fact that you are still able to uh, make income, you know, th that's a blessing, man. So congratulations mm -hmm. there. 30 locations. I mean, 30 machines, 15 locations. Are you doing this all yourself? Do you hire employees? Is it still a one-man operation? It's still one. Uh, well, actually, my girlfriend lives with me. Uh, she, she's always with me. She, uh, every single time we go fill up a machine, go get a product, you know, she always helps me out. And it's actually, she really does help me out a lot, you know, cause there's some times where I can't, um, especially with, you know, going back to YouTube, there's sometimes I got to edit a video and by the same time I have to go fill up machines. So she'll be the one that goes out. Uh, so it's really helpful, you know, having a partner, um, but even if I didn't, it would still be a one man job. Like I said, you know, I can, I can run the whole route in two days and that's still with 30 machines. So I could still get another 30, 60 machines and maybe like work every single day of the week, but it would still be doable. Gotcha. Let's talk YouTube for a second. This is where I learned about you. Mm -hmm. Why start a YouTube channel promoting and educating people on your journey in the vending machine business? So at first it started off just for fun. Um, like when I started, you know, I told you there was somebody that made videos about it. Before I made my first video, there was like a couple people making videos about it. Um, it was nothing too crazy. And there was like Facebook groups, you know, about it. Um, but there was not really much out there. So, and actually before I made that video, I used to just like making videos for fun. I had like a different channel. So I, I, you know, I was like making videos and yeah, I mean, just one day I was going out filling up my machines and I was like, you know what? I had a camera already ready. So I took my camera that day with me. I filmed the whole thing, um, you know, going to Sam's, buying the stuff, filling up the machines. And I edited the video. I had editing experience already from the other channels I've had. So I put the video together. I, I posted it. It did really good actually like the first week. And then literally just after like the first week, it just started blowing up. Like in the first 30 days, it was at a million views. Excuse and me? Was, a million views and that was the first video. Yeah. The very first video you put up? Yeah, first video. Okay, did you boost it in any way? Did you do anything special or did you just upload it? I just uploaded it. Um, I feel like the, I, honestly, I would say the biggest reason, number one, like you said, I was young and for someone that young to be out running a business, running around, filling up machines, I guess it was uh, kind of motivating for a lot of people. And I guess it just hit the algorithm that time. Cause there was, there was no really a lot of videos about it. Like I said, um, so that was like the first actual. How brand long new ago video. was this? Was this with your first machine? Um, no, no, that was, uh, last year in 2019 so your channels about a year old. Yeah. Like a year and a half now. Okay. Yeah. I posted the for, I posted that video, I think February and then it blew up like in March. And then I actually, it's crazy cause two months after that in April, the first video was in February and my birthday is April, is April 6th on April 5th, the day before my birthday, I hit a hundred thousand subscribers. <laughs> Hold on. You started your channel in February. Yeah. By April, you were already 100,000 subscribers? Yeah. It's only Are months. we talking 2019 or 2018? 2019. Congratulations. So last year. 
Congratulations. Thank you. Has YouTube helped your business? Yeah, for sure. I, I probably wouldn't have been this far if it wasn't for YouTube. Um, cause, uh, that's, I do YouTube for like my full-time job. So that's where most of my income comes from. And like I said earlier, you know, some, some machines that I buy are, are pretty expensive. So if I would have had like a regular job, I probably wouldn't been been able to afford all the, all the machines. So ultimately, where do you see your career going? Are you going to focus more because you're saying you're making more money on YouTube now? Are you mm. going to focus more on the growth in YouTube or is YouTube just to supplement you building this vending machine empire? Um, it's going to be both. So the goal is actually still do YouTube. I'm going to try to grow that, you know, as, as far as I can. And I know I can't make vending machine videos forever. So I know eventually uh, I'm going to be doing something else. Um, but that's the reason why I'm still going to be growing the vending machine business. So the goal is to, you know, the, go the goal is, uh, you know, I've always liked to dream big. The goal is to, you know, take over all of Dallas, you know, have a bunch of machines, hundreds, have employees, have route drivers. Uh, that's the goal for vending. So, for vending machines, you can see doing this long term. It's not like you're going to sell all of your routes in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'll definitely be doing this for probably forever. What is it that you wish you knew? Talk to me. I am just scratching the surface of wanting to get into this industry. What mm -hmm. is it that you wish you knew before you got into the business? So the only thing was learning about machines like because there is a lot of machines that you shouldn't buy uh most specifically like chinese made machines so just machines that are made like overseas um because there is like known american brands here in the u.s that is basically like the the go-to's um so and that's the that's the big issue with a lot of people when i see them starting out you know they go out they buy a machine that that's not good and then a couple of weeks after they put it on location, it starts messing, it starts messing up and you can't really buy parts for it. So then, you know, they might lose the location. Um, that's the only thing, just figuring out what, what machines, what brands are good. Okay. I didn't even think to ask you this. So this is a great point. Mm -hmm. Most people are going and they're looking online They're looking on Alibaba. Yeah. You're saying, stay away from vending machines that are not made locally yeah like not made here in the in the u.s so uh just because i mean it makes sense if you buy a machine from online coming from china they are a lot cheaper uh -huh. um well not a lot cheaper but cheaper buying them like because they're new so they're new and they're cheap um but you know coming from china they come in and once you need parts, you know, you can't really order parts, get them here in a couple of days. You have to wait, you know, who knows how long it's going to take coming from over there. Number one. And then number two, um, the customer service. So, you know, if you have an issue with the machine, how easy it is going to be calling the company all the way over there and trying to get a hold of somebody and help you out with the problem. So... I've only bought machines made here in the U.S. You know, I can give you a few brands, Crane, AMS, Wittern, USI. Those are like the, the big the big brands out here. And those again, slowly, please. Um, AMS, Crane, USI, Royal. Um, those are the, the main ones. Okay, so those are pretty much the brands that you use yourself and you feel good. You've mentioned several times in this interview that you have very little problems with them breaking down or having to replace parts. So they're well built. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very well built, good quality. And like I said, if you have an issue with them, the number is always on the machine. Give them a call and they help you out. Jaime, first, I got to thank you so much for being so forthcoming. You have provided a wealth of information. And if anybody is watching this and has made it to the end of this video, you've cut out a lot of legwork for them. 
You know, mm -hmm. they, they now have a roadmap, and that's what this Power Move Maker show is all about. So I thank you so much for your time, first and foremost. Please tell everybody, where can they find you if they want to reach you? Uh, the best way to reach me would be Instagram. Um, that's just at Jaime Ibanez. Um, the same as my YouTube or pretty much anywhere, on Twitter, anywhere, just Jaime Ibanez. Um, and I'm, most, I'm mostly active on Instagram, though, so that's where anyone wants to reach me. Shoot me a DM. Jaime, I know the last name Ibanez is normal for you, but for the average person, it is not. Mm -hmm. Please spell that out mm -hmm. so that people can reach you and get to the right person. Yeah, so Ibanez, that's I-B-A-N-E-Z, just like the guitar brand. I'm not sure if you, if you heard of it. I'm not uh, familiar. Yeah. I'm sorry. No? It's, uh, yeah, it's Ibanez, though. I-B-A-N-E-Z. Got you. So Jaime Ibanez, and that's pretty much across all platforms. Yeah. Jaime, thank you so much. I am inspired by you. I love the fact that you're 20 years old. Mm -hmm. You are, this is, this is what the American dream is all about. And you are a shining representation of why this show power move makers was created. I believe you are a true power move maker. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for being so forthcoming with information. I know, you know, people don't like to always disclose numbers or put things out there because of fear of competition. And the fact that you were so forthcoming, I really appreciate you. And there's going to be a ton of people who watch this who are going to thank you for it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It really means a lot. You know, I love what you're doing, helping uh, everyone, you know, showing them the new ways. Uh, but yeah, also good luck to all the viewers out there watching. If you're going to get into it, good luck. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Continue blessings and success. Mm hmm Peace and love. Thank you. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.